work that out yet. So you got to know the code word like this is when you start walking up. So you'll be there magically teleporting to the right place at the right time. <clears throat> All right. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12, verses 22 to 32 this morning. We're going to talk about worrying, anxieties, and fears. And my wife already warned me, you make everyone angry when you talk about that. At least on social media, it seems like I stir up things. And I told her, I was like, well, I'm just trying to teach people. She's like, they don't like it. So I was like, okay. So this could be a big winner or a big loser today, I guess. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. Here's what I will tell you, is that I have a really strong confidence that we're actually going to be going through a lot of actually kind of intellectual stuff. There's going to be some learning involved. If you're a note taker, be ready to rock and roll, because there's going to be a lot of good stuff. And, and I think we're going to be doing an exhaustive study on a couple important topics to understand Jesus used this phrase, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He said that many times. He said it in the Gospels. He says it in the book of Revelation. If you have ears to hear, let them hear. And I would pray that anyone who would hear this message here today, online, later, whenever, that we'd have ears to hear because, you see, anxiety and anxiety disorders Right? I, I read this morning that one in five Americans could be diagnosed with some kind of an anxiety disorder. It's something that affects a lot of people. And that's the people who could be diagnosed with something from a doctor, let alone those who just know I worry and I struggle with worrying and anxiety. And I do think that there is great instruction in the Word of God to help us to show us the path for freedom but you'll have to bear with me because, again, I think there's some things we're going to have to wrestle with that are mature things, that are things that we have to really face and ask ourselves some serious questions and move forward with. And so let's look here at verse 22. It says, Then he, Jesus speaking, said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you'll put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Let's just pray over that right now, and then we'll dive in. Lord Jesus, we come before you because we desire to hear from you. We desire to hear what you have to say to us, and you've spoken it here in your word. Your words are recorded, and you are the word made flesh. We pray that you would give us ears to hear. You'd give us softened hearts. Lord, that you could teach us how to apply some of these principles to other areas in our life where we struggle with other things. And I pray, God, that today people will leave this place with a vision of a path to a freedom from their worries and their fears. So God, let us be expectant to see you move and let us always be ready and excited to see what your word has to speak to each one of us individually. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So right off the bat, we're going to start with our question, what are worries, cares, anxieties? I'm going to do a couple things. We're going to break some things down. I think as we look at this, uh, I want to start by, like I said, intellectually, I want to understand what the Bible says. I want to know what the Bible says on the topic because everything else is kind of rubbish in comparison, right? I mean, we can read whatever other books, any other psychology, anything else, much of which may, which, much of which may have some good information, but I want to know what the Bible has to say. It's interesting because the English word, worry, it's from an Anglo-Saxon root, because you all wanted to know that, but it comes from an Anglo-Saxon word that means to strangle or suffocate. And that's where we get our word worry from. And all the worriers in the room said, amen, right? I mean, that's the idea is like, no, you know this feeling of suffocation. You know this feeling of, of when worries, when anxieties, when these troubles, they make us feel like we're getting choked out, all right? And so we need to look at this word worry. And I'm going to put a bunch of stuff up on the screen. And I'm going to talk my way through it. Good luck if you're a note taker. But here's the thing. It's a lot of information because I wanted to get exhaustive. So in verse 22, 
and multiple places, three places here in the section we're covering this morning, we find a verb, merimnao. We've talked about this just recently when we were talking about Mary and Martha, and Martha had worries. And we did a little study on worries just a few weeks back. But this Greek word is 19 times in the New Testament. And so by looking at all the places in the New Testament where this word is used, I can better understand it. Now, Jesus gives a do not worry section in the Sermon on the Mount. These are different sermons, but he repeats his information just like I do. See, I'm being Christ-like when I tell you guys stories you've already heard me turn, but anyway. So five times there, three times here in Luke. There's about half, right? Three times in 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about worries concerning marriage. Paul is just saying, if you get married, there's going to be concerns and cares involved with just being married. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus, this is a a parallel account, he tells people not to worry. It's actually just a chapter back in Luke. When they they take you and arrest you and stand you before judges and magistrates, don't worry about what to say. I will give you words to speak. So there's two more of the places it shows up. It's also in 1 Corinthians 12 and Philippians 2, where we are actually commanded to worry or care over our brothers and sisters. So he's actually saying, you know, it's just like words like pride. Pride is a sin, yet we all should know too, not all pride is sinful. When you're proud that your toddler or your baby just started walking, there's nothing sinful about that kind of pride. Just like cares and worries, there are bad ones, but there's also a good one. He wants us to have a general concern for our brothers and sisters. A few weeks ago, we covered Martha. You have many cares, Martha, many troubles, many things. We talked about that inward and outward uh, thing that was going on with her. And then finally, the last place in the New Testament where you see this word, merimnao, the verb to worry, is Philippians 4, 6, and 7, which many of us should be familiar with because I mention it like every single week, I think. Be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be known to God, and the peace of God as our past understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. So we know that. But that's where this word shows up, okay? We're painting a picture here. Marriage brings worries and concerns, And we should have some kind of a concern for each other. But typically, Jesus is saying, don't worry. In general, about other things. Worry about your spouse in a good way. Worry about your brothers and your sisters. But don't worry about the other stuff in life. And that's what he's going to talk about, not worrying about the other stuff. I want to add now, again, this is exhaustive study. You're going to walk away saying, I know every place in the Bible that this word shows up. But then you should know, that you know what God wants you to know. You know everything there is in the Bible about this subject. So merimna is the noun, right? Worrying, the verb was what we looked at. Now we're looking at the thing, worries. It's only six times, okay? And once it's in Luke 21, where Jesus warns, do not let worries distract you from my coming, that you may stand before the Son of Man. This is what he's saying is, I want you guys to be ready and watching. That's tonight in Luke 12. He goes into that as well in chapter 12, to be ready, watching, and working, and waiting when he arrives. Don't let cares and worries distract you from him. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says he has concern for the churches. All the churches he planted, he has a, a worry in him, but it's more of a concern in the context. It's, it's a good thing. But then of the six, three of them are found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's accounts of the parable of the sower, specifically the thorny soil. And I think it, as I've taught that parable many times, so often we catch the riches part. Don't strive for riches because it's going to choke out the seed, right? But in every gospel, it's also the cares. It's not just people striving to get rich that are getting their faith choked out. It's the people burdened by worries and cares. He says those worries and cares, they're going to stunt your growth. They're going to steal your fruit. They're going to take away the blessings and the perks and the joy that are supposed to come naturally with faith. 
The last place, the sixth place that word care or worry is found is in 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares, care or cares, upon him, for he cares for you. And that word he cares is actually a different word. That's a word about having affection and a, and a true care, a nurturing care. But it says, cast our cares upon him. That's what the Bible says about worrying about anxieties. It's the same word in the Greek that they use back and forth. Now, later in verse 29, I'm going to jump around a little bit in this text we're in today. He said, do not have an anxious mind at the end there. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you should drink. You should have an anxious mind. Now, in the authorized old King James, it's doubtful. And doubtful might even be a better word because it's actually two things that are being described here. So here's the other thing he's warning us about. Our word anxious. This is the only place in the Bible where this Greek word shows up. Meteorizomai. That's a big one to say. It literally means, if you take the word and break it into pieces, to be lifted up and suspended helplessly in the air. This is what he's talking about is we can let these problems in our life. What I imagine, I don't know if you're in Star Wars or Marvel, you can pick your your fantasy, but you're going to fight the bad guy and that guy has levitation powers. So you're like, here I come. And all of a sudden he's like, you're floating in the air. It's like, this is unfortunate. Like you you, you can't do anything because you're just floating there. But that's what Jesus says can overtake us. Don't let this thing overtake your mind. Don't have a mind where you're just floating and helpless. And so this word is used in other old ancient writings as a metaphor. I wrote it down out of the dictionary, out of the Strong's, right? By a metaphor taken from ships that are tossed about on the deep by wind and waves. What I loved about today's message is that you can go back to this week or to this week or to this week. And if you've been with us over the last few months, all these messages are just kind of coming together. When we talked about the wind and the waves, where they were worrying, and Jesus has to rebuke the waves, right? That he controls them. But this is the idea is we can have an anxiety take us over to where we're just like a boat being tossed in the sea. James, the brother of our Lord, he said in verse 6 of chapter 1 of his epistle, but let him ask in faith without doubting, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And a little later, we're going to start talking about the faith and worries and the connection there. So he's saying, without faith, without faith, you'll be like this. The waves just getting tossed around. There's that Greek word we just talked about, meteoizomai. It means to be tossed around or you're up off the ground, you're floating, you can't control anything. This is what worry is in the Bible. It's this state of helplessness because of our cares, because of things that are important to us, because we put value on them, and then they cripple us. And so Jesus is trying to instruct people how not to worry. And you'll note at the beginning in verse 22, it says, he said to his disciples, he was doing a public talk, but this worrying portion, he begins to zero in now on those who are his followers, those who listen to him, those whom he thinks will take this and actually use it. I'm going to tell you guys something you guys can apply in your life. And he starts it with therefore in verse 22. Therefore, I say to you, what's the therefore, right? You have to ask, what is it there for? If you back up, there's the parable of the rich fool. We won't cover it this morning. We'll cover it tonight. But in short, it was this guy stocking up and loading up on all these earthly things. And as soon as he decides, I have too much stuff, I'm going to need bigger barns. So he builds these bigger barns. And he's like, ah, I've built the bigger barns. Then he dies. (laughs) And God's like, man, you spent all this time focusing on all this stuff, but you have no riches in heaven. You haven't been focusing on the heavenly things, the things that matter. And so Jesus is actually contrasting greed with worry. See, greed is a fear that you, uh, you, that you want more. Greed is wanting more. Worry is fear that you don't have enough. You see the connection between the two? Greed is I want more, more, more. 
Worry is never enough, never enough, never enough. Amazing how one couple might struggle with the two things that has the same net results. One might be into greedy. They might want more things, bigger things, better things. The other one's worried they never have enough. And doesn't that just turn into a crazy cycle right there where one's trying to get more things and the other one's worried that they don't have enough for the things they already have? And all of a sudden you have a, a, a marriage in despair because of greed and because of worry. Now, here's where we start getting into the, to the, to the harder stuff. Again, what is worry? I got this from Warren Wearsby and I really liked it because he said it, not me, so I don't have to take the blame. Worry is deformative. It keeps us from growing, and it makes us like the unsaved in the world. In short, worry is unchristian. Worry is a sin. How can we witness to a lost world and encourage them to put faith in Jesus Christ if we ourselves are doubting God and worrying? This is where my wife says that no one likes me, because I like that. Um, I've gotten in big trouble with people by making the statement that worrying is sin. And we're going to get into that in a second. But notice he says right at the bat, it's deformative. Remember, all three gospel accounts of the parable of the sower, it is worry that is the thorns and thistles and stuff that chokes out the believer and takes away their ability to bear fruit. I've been on a Corey Tenboon kick lately, and she said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow it simply empties the day of its strength. There's something beautiful. If you've never gotten a chance, I think I may have sh- I shared a video online of her in an interview or just talking, and I could sit and just listen to that lady forever because she was in a Nazi concentration camp, and she's explaining to us how not to worry about stuff. She understands what it's like to be under pressure and under stress, and she has this cute little you know, accent as she talks, you know? But I was there with Jesus, and he was with me, so it was okay. And you're like, oh, there we go. She just explained it so easily. <laughs> I've got Jesus. Why should I even worry? <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Like, man. But it's, she's so pretty as she says it. And she said it's amazing stuff about prayer and about worrying and trusting God. But Wearsby said that it is unchristian and it is sin. And this is where I think I lose people. You call worry sin, and people get angry. I think I've had people leave before because I've made that comment. And so I thought, what a great time to talk about what is sin. This is a little mini side study. But I think as you guys learn more about the word of God, as you guys grow and understand these concepts, this is theology stuff. But you see, if I don't know what these things are, then as I read the word of God and see these words, I won't know how to actually apply it to myself. Here's a verse that kind of shows us that there's lots of different words for sin. In Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I have said I'll confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Now, all of us know those are all bad words, right? Like you don't want iniquity nor transgression nor, but they're all different, having specific meanings. And if we understand what those meanings are, this can help us in all areas of your faith. Okay, so it was a worthy detour, I felt like. And so here's the deal. To sin. It literally means in English, like old English, to miss the mark. It was an archery term. That is where it originated is in English. You know, where there's Greek words and Hebrew words. But when you don't hit the bullseye, it's a sin. Note, what is the bullseye? The bullseye is perfection. Perfection. Absolute perfect holiness. If it's outside of God's perfect will, if it's outside of perfect holiness, it's sin. Now, this knowledge can help us because we start realizing that, you know, there's a lot of sin. Sin can be commission or omission. I can commit sins by doing things. I also can sin by not doing things. That's important for us to know. James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That means that two of you could be sitting next to each other right now in the, in the rows and, and one of you could be in sin and the other not because one of you knows what you ought to do. And now it is put upon you to know. You know. 
Now you're held accountable to go and proactively do these things. Romans 14, 23 says, for whatever is not from faith is sin. I.e., if I can't do it with a clear conscience. You see, there are things that I can't do with a clear conscience that some of you might be able to, that the Bible has not forbidden, right? This is not something that says don't do it. But for whatever reason, God's laid it on my heart. Like, you know what, Lord? Even though I might, that may be permissible, I feel like you don't want me to do it. And now that I can't do it in faith, it would be sin for me to do those things, just in my personal relationship with God. Now, sin is missing the mark. To sin, the verb. But what is then sin? Because there's a difference. You know, in the Bible, you see sins with an S versus no sin, or no S, just sin. They're different. Sin by itself in the singular, not an action and not in the plural. When it's used plural, it means the things you've done. But when you talk about my sin, it's the result of the fall. Death came because of sin. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. It goes in talking about how death is because of sin. If there was no sin in the world, no one would die. So when I say something is sin, we have to understand it's the consequences of the fall. Thorns didn't come around until the fall. Bushes started growing thorns. Things came into the world that we have no control over, but these things are missing the mark. They're missing the mark of God's holiness. They're also missing the mark of God's desire for you and for me. So much of the sin we struggle with and deal with, it's not something I'm doing. It's just the effects that I'm having to live through. David said, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He goes, I was born into sin. See, when you tell someone that this is a sin, they get defensive. No, but we're born into sin. We're brought into a world full of sin, and I'm trying to survive this life full of sin. Now, trespass. We'll do these other ones a little quicker. This means literally to cross the line. We all have seen no trespassing signs before. It makes perfect sense. Whether intentionally or unintentionally. A trespass in the Bible is when you cross a line whether you know it or not. Leviticus 5.15, if a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring to the Lord his trespass offering with a ram without blemish, blah, blah, blah. It goes on. There were whole categories of offerings in Leviticus for unintentional sins that people didn't even know they did. But they brought the offering realizing, Lord, I'm bringing this one to you just because I know I'm probably doing things that aren't right and I don't even know that I'm doing them. But again, a trespass. It could be intentional or unintentional. We are commanded, I'll use that word again, we're commanded by James to confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, we need to be able to confess trespasses because they could have been unintentional. You could unintentionally offend someone in this church body. You didn't mean it. You didn't even know you did it. But maybe they bring it to you. You bring it to them. And it, it, this is how things get worked out so they can be prayed about and so that healing can take place. Now, other than trespasses, there's transgressions. This is presumptuous sin, willful trespasses done with the full knowledge of the error. This is where you go and do something and you knew you shouldn't have done it. And you knew it as you did it. Yet, we all still do this stuff, right? Because David says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. All this stuff is coverable by the blood of Christ. Don't forget about worries and fears. We're getting back there. But this is important that we understand what sin is so that we can understand who our Savior is who came to save the world from sin. Transgressions are willful. Let me give an, an illustration, I think, that at least the men will be able to understand. I've heard it said that you're driving down the road and there's the girl jogging by, that it's the first look isn't sin, it's the second look that is sin. I would disagree. Both looks are sin. You see, I'm driving down the road and I don't even try to look at someone's chain link fence. It doesn't even draw my attention, just the slightest bit. Fire hydrant goes right by. Don't even look at the fire hydrant. Dog, ball, grass, girl. I have a first look. Trans, a trespass. 
It was maybe even unintentional. The second look is transgression. But we should be confessing our trespasses to God, too, that at night, in the morning, Lord, still a sinner. All these things today came by and it reminded me that I'm still a sinner. And Lord, I'm not transgressing. Maybe I am. But the idea is, is but you know what, Lord? It's the second I realized what was happening, I stopped. I controlled. I took my, my thoughts captive. And I'm keeping on the line. That's the difference between a trespass and a transgression. One is willful. One is unintentional. It just kind of happens. But you did, you did something you shouldn't have done. And then lastly is iniquity. Now, iniquity is deeply rooted, premeditated, unrepentant sin. Here's the idea. The girl catching your eye is a trespass. Because the only reason you look as a man or woman or whoever, right, is because you have lust inside. That's just part of, like, your body. And so, boom, the sin inside of me manifests itself, but I keep it in check. But on the Internet, slipping into pornography could also just be a transgression. You knew you shouldn't do it. It was a willful act of disobedience. But not deleting your subscription, not deleting the pictures off your phone, not throwing away the magazine under the bed, that's iniquity. This is something like, I'm hanging on to this and I'm not letting it go. Every one of these things are all covered by the blood of Jesus. That's the beautiful part. If we are saved, we're saved from all of our sins. It doesn't matter how rebellious my sin gets. Psalm 51, after David sins with Bathsheba, he commits adultery and kills her husband to try and cover it up. He prays to God, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He goes on in Psalm 51, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And so it's just a good reminder that sins are all covered by the blood of Jesus. So why is it important then? Why the big rabbit trail? Because it's important to know that anxieties and fears are not God's will for you. It's not God's desire for his children to be afraid. Do any of you want your kids to be afraid? worried? Do you want your children to be afraid? Now, again, are there other ways of using the word? Yes. I want my kids fearful of the chainsaw to an extent. You know, there's, there's things like that. And that's not what I'm talking about. So I would hate to get sidetracked with, you know, weird exceptions. But here's the deal. If I know that anxiety and fear is sin, then I know that I can confess it and rest assured that Jesus has paid for it. Therefore, I don't need to live in guilt if you have worries or fears. If you're a worrisome person, you don't need to feel guilty about it. Because the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But might I suggest, if you treat worrying like a thing about who I am, the way I was made, my personal problem, my personal struggle, you're taking that all on yourself. If you treat it like a sin, then it is something you can and should confess of and confess often and rest assured that God forgives me. See, this is why I say it's sin and it's important that as Christians we recognize that, that the Bible calls it sin, but that means the Bible then provides the cure. The other thing we need to know is that if it's sin, it means that he has given us a helper to help us deal with sin. The Holy Spirit is given to us to give us strength, power, and everything we need to fight sin. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. Romans 6 through 8, let's read the whole thing. No, it's a lot to read, so we're not going to read the whole thing. But Romans 6 talks about how we are no longer slaves to sin because of Jesus. So if you feel like you're a slave to your fears, the Bible says, I've got an open door for you to free you from your fears, that you're no longer a slave to this sin anymore. Because if it's a sin, it's something I freed you from. Yet, Paul the Apostle, Romans chapter 7, we should all know the text. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will free me from this body of sin and death? Why is it I find myself doing the things that I hate and yet not doing the things I know I need to be doing? That's Paul speaking. And it's beautiful. And it is a sovereign 
divine work of the Holy Spirit that nowhere in the Bible do we ever find out what, what it was that Paul struggled with. So whether you struggle today with lust or addiction or worries and fears or an anger and wrathful spirit, Paul might have been struggling with the exact same thing that you struggle with. And the guy who just wrote that I'm no longer a slave wrote, but some reason I still struggle with this. 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about how there's that thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that is. Lots of scholars speculate. And there's some good theories, but we don't know. And we know he asked God to be delivered from it. And God said, no, my grace, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made great in, in your weaknesses. And so sometimes you wonder, why does God not deliver me from these things all the way? Well, maybe it's because God wants to keep us in a place of continual repentance, continual coming to him, asking him for help, continually coming back to dad. He kind of wants to see his kids. So, but I know that the spirit is there. And then after Romans 7 comes Romans 8, where there's all the promises. There's no condemnation to those who are in the spirit and they don't walk according to the flesh. We have all the promises that we can cry out, Abba, Father, because we've been adopted and we're God's kids, right? Romans 8, 28, that he works all things to the good. And so somehow he can use these things I've been wrestling with up until this point today to somehow shape me and mold me into the person that I need to be for him to use because he's pre-ordained, foreordained me for good works, predestined. That's the next verse in Romans 8. And what shall people do? Nothing can do any, no one can do anything to us or against us. Why? Because we're more than conquerors through Christ. It just, the Romans 8 just goes, and, and that's the thing. Those are all the promises now that if my worries and anxieties are sins, then it's something God has given me all these promises to deal with. And so the question is, what do we do? All right? I think we've, we've driven it home. This is what anxiety is and worries are according to the Bible. This is what sin is according to the Bible so that we don't beat ourselves up because you're always going to have sin. See, some people talk about like, oh, I haven't, you know, I haven't sinned in eight months. Maybe Lord willing, I doubt it, but hey, you haven't transgressed. You have not willfully disobeyed God. And you know what? There are some godly men and women I've met who just, man, they have such a great, amazing relationship that I would almost believe them. You've gone this many months without willfully, knowingly trespassing on purpose. But you've still trespassed and you still sin. So what do we do? So here's one thing that's important. And then we're going to break down some of the stuff they talk about how to deal with this. At the end of the section on the ravens, and we're actually going to read this all, so don't think I'm skipping it all. I'm just kind of working my way in. This is all the introduction. We have a whole sermon coming up real soon. Um, look at verse 28. It says, If God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Oligopistos. One last word study. It's the last one. But this is also interesting, and I thought this was mind-blowingly informative to me. There is a word for little faith. It's like one word, oligopistos, and it's used five times in the New Testament. Twice was in the don't worry sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount and in Luke 12. Again, different sermons, but the same material. The other three times, Matthew 8, when the disciples were worried that the boat was going to sink, Jesus says, you have little faith. When Peter, after the walking on the water, thought he was going to sink, Jesus says, you have little faith. And when the disciples hop in the boat in Matthew 16, and they're freaking out because like, oh, we didn't bring bread, we've got no bread, we're going to starve. Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. Jesus Christ uses this phrase, this word in the Greek, rebuking his disciples and telling them what their problem is, is a lack of faith. And it's always in response to them worrying. Every time in the Bible Jesus uses this phrase is in response to worrying. George Mueller said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Now, Mueller is quite the man, you know, to 
to try and compare ourselves to. But he was a wise man. And he actually said, because I've heard people say, well, that was George Mueller. You know, I mean, not all of us have such amazing faith. And I'll say amen to that. Most of us will never have the faith of George Mueller. And yet, George Mueller himself would tell you that it is a lie from Satan, his own words, a lie from Satan if anyone would ever tell you that what I have is special and unique to me and not something that God does not want for every one of his children. That is why Mueller wrote his book on God caring for him and the orphans and all that he did. We have his autobiography in the bookstore. It's one of my favorite books. Um, it's not, you know, thrilling and this and that. It's just, it's his autobiography. And it's just breathtaking at places to see what this man would do. But you'll see, he says it's faith. How can I worry if I have faith in an amazing, all-powerful, unchanging God? You see, like the man who comes to Jesus in Mark 9, who, who asks for deliverance for his son from that demon, he says, Lord, I, I believe, help my unbelief. This is not challenging your or my or any of our salvation faith, our saving faith, but the faith to believe of what God can and will do. Does it make sense? I, I, I can't worry and have faith Full faith, the beginning of true faith, as Mueller puts it, at the same time. You just can't have both at once. I want to do a little demonstration for you guys. I thought, what better way to demonstrate perfect faith than to have someone who is full of faith come on up here on the stage with me and demonstrate what amazing faith looks like. So that said, Arla Christie, come on up here. Thank you for volunteering. I know. I knew you would be excited when I called your name out. Um, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to do a, a, an amazing faith of amazing faith for everyone. First, I just need you to come up here and have a seat, and then we'll, we'll let the show begin, all right? She's excited. That's why she volunteered with her eyes. All right, sit down, and then we'll watch. So are you all ready? All right. We're done. Thank you. Everyone, you're, oh, don't, you don't get to go anywhere yet, but hey, let's give a clap. Come on. Let's clap for her. She did it. Sit back down. Sit back down. Oh, sit back down. Okay, so... Do I need to like get that thing so I can interview you? Um, how, how, how's it going today? Great. Okay, amazing. Um, so, did you all notice that she came up here and for not one second did she eyeball this chair? Did you notice she didn't give it a little, you know, thump the tires? She didn't shake it? Like, tell me, did you for one second think that this chair was going to collapse under you? No. So, Hebrews 11, I'll let you go down soon, don't worry, not yet though, I like having you here. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance, um, um, hypostasis, it's, it's, it's hupo to be above and over, and stasis is like a foundation. Um, it's the idea, it's faith is a base that we work off of, we build off of faith, and I like how one person put it. Watchman Nee said, the substantiation of things hoped for. Faith is when I take for all this stuff that I hope for and I substantiate it. I actually see it become reality. And when you can sit on a chair like Arla did, she had perfect faith in the chair. If I have that kind of faith in God, what is there to worry about? Two pop quiz questions, Arla. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what tomorrow holds? No. Do you know who holds tomorrow? Yes. There you go. Thanks, Arla. Come here. <laughs> so, if we believe these things we read, if we have faith, I'm not actually using this mic. I'm holding it like I am, though. Uh, then we have nothing to fear and nothing to worry about. And my challenge is, if you treat worries like sin, then you treat it like something that I can repent of. Now, is it easy to do? I never said it was easy, right? No one's saying it's easy. You want six-pack abs and amazing guns? Lift weights and, and diet. It's not easy, but you know the recipe, right? But it's something we can repent of. It's something we can confess to God privately, 
and or publicly, however the Holy Spirit leads us, it's something can be prayed about, and it's something that is sin. Therefore, it's missing the mark of what God would desire for me. Therefore, he desires to enable me to be successful in getting past this stuff. So what does Jesus say? Because he gives us advice here in our text, and we've just been kind of skipping around it, right? He says, consider the ravens and the lilies. Let's just read it. Verse 24, it says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you worrying can add one cubit to his stature? And if you, then you are not able for the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Just so we understand a few things, the ravens were unclean. Right? They weren't, they weren't edible nor sacrificable. I don't know if it's a word, but it is now. So they have no value. You know, we've heard in the last chapter even, Jesus actually said the sparrows. You know, sparrows are bought for, they're cheap. But sparrows could be sacrificed. They actually had a value. Ravens were like even more worthless than a sparrow. But they don't worry about anything. And you notice that birds, they don't, they don't store up any food, right? I mean, they... They just go out daily expecting to survive on what is provided for them. He says, you can't add one cubit to your stature. Now, the Greek word there for stature can actually describe height or age. It's like you can pick either one. I think age is actually a better translation. And the idea is by a cubit would be a pace. Even though it's adding a length to a time, to, to the Jew and to the people back then, the idea is one step. A cubit was about one step. So it's, you can't add one step to your life by worrying. So then why are you worrying about all this other stuff? I.e., although you guys already knew it, worrying doesn't accomplish anything. The Bible has many exhortations, many, about the wisdom of planning, of thinking ahead, but that's not worrying. Don't play around and say, I'm just planning. No, you're worrying, right? I mean, so we need to know that. But he says, think of the lilies, these beautiful flowers. They don't have to work. They don't spin as in like spinning yarn and putting things together to make these clothes. And the fields, the idea is the grass is just going to burn up and be gone. And yet God decorates the fields with these beautiful lilies, even though the fields are just going to be gone. So how much more does he want to take care of you? You'll notice with the raven, it's provision, and here it's clothing, but it's, you know, it's stuff that isn't necessarily needed. But God wants to take care of the little details. Consider the ravens. We read that and maybe think about it for a second, then move on. It is said that, that Abraham Lincoln read these verses, and so he went outside and just sat, and he stared at plants, and he stared at birds, and he considered. That word consider is where uh, we get a, a root for stargazing and, and, and focusing and looking at the stars. Hebrews 3.1 says, consider Jesus. Really take it in and think about this. So God says, hey, just actually think about it for a second. All these other things don't worry. And yet you are precious to me. And you think I'm going to let you fail or fall? And so he says, you have little faith. Verse 29, he says, do not seek what you should eat or should drink or have that anxious mind that was that being tossed around, right? For all these things the nations of the world seek after and your father knows that you need these things. This is where we as we made the comment, how are we supposed to witness to a lost world when sometimes we behave just as lost as them? even if not in sin, like, well, I'm not out there doing this and doing that. Right, but you don't act like an all-powerful God is in charge of your life. And so we need to take the time to have faith, like Arla did, in God's promises. Consider God's promises. I just went to Philippians because it's such a beautiful book. 
Philippians 1, 6, being confident in this very thing that he's begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Have faith that you are a work in progress of which God has promised to complete. We can believe it, have faith that that's a true statement. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his, for his good pleasure. God is the one at work in you. He's the one who will do the work for you. We need to have faith that he doesn't want you to sit there and fight and struggle. He wants you to grow your faith and allow him to step in. And we've already talked about it once, but again, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God and that mind-blowing peace, the peace that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. That's a two for one, right? Mind-blowing peace is what God promises us. And even better than that, the kingdom of God. Look at this where it says in verse 31, we're all pretty familiar with the parallel passage, but seek first the kingdom of God. I can't even say it without uh, quoting the other one. But seek the kingdom of God and these things shall be added to you. We're all used to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So seek the kingdom. That's good advice. But look at the next verse and then highlight it and then box it in verse 32. Do not fear Little flock, the only place in the Bible Jesus uses that phrase. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's not just something we're supposed to be seeking for. That heavenly Father who provides for us, he cares for us, and he doesn't desire for us to worry. He wants you to know that it's actually his pleasure to give us the kingdom. And that word kingdom, the kingdom of God, it's a confusing. I didn't want to do a whole other word study, but it's fascinating because many scholars, you know, they, they, they nitpick over the details of what's the kingdom of God because he says it so many things about it. We need to preach the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God has come near to you. In the previous chapter, he says the kingdom of God is upon you. You need to seek the kingdom, uh, but the kingdom is inside of you. It's within you, it says in a few chapters in Luke. So what's the kingdom? And I think one of the best way I understood it is in the previous chapter, chapter 11, but you all have it memorized, so you don't even need to flip there. When you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, there's something about the kingdom of God and the way Jesus speaks about it is that there is a coming kingdom where he will completely rule and reign. Sin will be gone. Righteousness will reign. We will be with him. He will be with us. There will be no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain. He wipes away every tear. And yet there's a promise here that some of that can be experienced now. Some of that can be experienced as we fellowship with God now. You see, all that beauty we speak of, it's when we get to forevermore fellowship with God. But we have an opportunity to fellowship with with God now. This is what I've learned about worrying as I studied this text is that from any sin, illness, or anything, God can, has, and does miraculously deliver people. But quite often that's not the case. As I discussed with a friend yesterday, the book of Acts is like 30 some years. People think we should look like the book of Acts. It's like that's a highlight reel over multiple decades. God isn't always just miraculously taking things away. But this is what I've found is that as I grow in my maturity, in my fellowship with him, and in my personal faith, I solve the problem of oh, ye with little faith. And the fears and the worries, the anger, the lust, the addiction becomes easier and easier to work through and get past because of simply growing in him. I didn't think, and who knows, there's still time left in our service, that someone was going to get prayed for today and miraculously never worry again. But I truly felt in my heart that every person 
could see a gate to a path that they know leads to peace. But it happens chapter by chapter and verse by verse, Sunday by Sunday, midweek, Sunday night, fellowship, home Bible studies, personal morning devotions. It's growing up as a Christian, and that only takes time and effort. I I might not be able to get you cured tomorrow, but I can put you on a path that will absolutely lead you there. We just have to make those decisions. I didn't address the issue, but I didn't want to not address the issue as we wrap up. You know, anxieties can be true um, clinically. You know, th- there are things the doctors identify. This person has a chemical imbalance. Here's the thing I go back to. Is God's desire for you to be a chemical imbalance? And if it's not, then it's sin. It's consequences of living in a fallen world. Someone might struggle with this one. Other people struggle with different things. But I know it's not God's desire for me. I know that in the moment, moment by moment, my faith does this. And I know that God's desire is to free me. It doesn't mean don't seek help. And it doesn't mean don't, this is bad or anything like that. You know, Paul tells Timothy to drink some wine with his water for his stomach problems. He didn't tell Timothy to buck up in his faith, right? I mean, there's times that we need help to get us going down that path. But at the same time, I have baptized People here, I remember one time before a baptism, I didn't even know the story. And all of a sudden, the person's saying how I was depressed, I was on all these antidepressants, and then I found Jesus, and I've been free of them. I was like, that's awesome. It wasn't something that just happened overnight either. It was as this person grew in their faith. I've got another brother who just this week talking on the phone, going through hell in his own life, lots of things to worry about, But when we started our conversation, he asked me, hey, before we get started, can I pray for you? Is there anything you need to be praying about? And by the end of our conversation, we were laughing because we were saying, six months ago, do you ever think you were going to ask me for my prayer needs? And we laughed about it. But we're like, yeah, but God's taken you a long way in six months, hasn't he? You see, God wants to grow us. And so the, the, the true end to worries, suffering, fear, it's not just this like, oh, I pray this little prayer that the pastor taught me, and it's not just a, I'm going to be delivered miraculously necessarily. I'm not going to cast the the demon of, of fear out of you. I'm just going to say, you know what? Draw near to God day by day, little by little, and as you come to know him more and the power that he has, God will help and deliver you of these things. So, there you have it. A lot of information, but I think, I think we dug in and we, we tried to understand some things on a different level than maybe we've known before, more than I knew before, taking the time to really dive deep on this. So the answer is your relationship with Jesus Christ and your faith in him. Do not leave here focusing on how you can solve your fears and your worries. Leave here Asking God, how do I draw nearer to you? How do I get closer to you? And how does my faith grow in you? And that will solve all the other problems. Let's pray.